This video is sponsored by Lumerit. Lumerit, a better way to do college. Alexander the Great is dead. In his lifetime, this Macedonian had changed the whole nature of the ancient world, forming the greatest empire the world had yet seen. With his death, however, this empire would never be the same again. This documentary series will focus on the ensuing struggle that followed Alexander's passing, as former brothers-in-arms became the most vicious of enemies. These were the wars of his successors. On the 11th of June, 323 BC, Alexander the Great passed away. He had left the formidable empire, stretching from Greece to India. Yet its fate was far from certain. Alexander's only living child had been deemed illegitimate. His half-brother Aridaeus was mentally ill. And although one of his wives, Roxanne, was pregnant, there was no guarantee the child would be a son. A clash for the authority began, and one of Alexander's greatest generals, Perdiccas, emerged as the victor. Aridaeus became king as Philip III. Perdiccas was to be the commander-in-chief. The great expeditions to Arabia and Carthage planned by Alexander were abandoned, and his generals began dividing the provinces among themselves, in what was later called the Partition of Babylon. One of the most notable gainers from this partition was the personal secretary of Alexander, Eumenes, a Greek from Cardia, who was militarily untested until now. Not long afterwards, Roxanne had given birth to a son, who became Alexander IV. Perdiccas, who ruled in Babylon, was assigned to act as regent. Meanwhile, revolts had erupted in both east and west. A large force of 23,000 disgruntled Greeks abandoned their posts in Bactria and started their journey home. Greece. Many cities had revolted against the Macedonian rule. The regent of Macedonia, Antipater, headed south to crush the Greeks, while Perdiccas sent one of his generals, Python, east to deal with the uprising in Bactria. Perdiccas's political position was weak, and he proposed a marriage with Nicaea, a daughter of Antipater, to strengthen it. The marriage was agreed and Nicaea began the long journey to Babylon. Perdiccas turned his attention to other pressing matters. In 322 BC, he led an army to help the new governor of Cappadocia, Eumenes. The province had never been completely conquered by Alexander, and remnants of Persian resistance remained strong under the king Ariarates. The neighbouring governors refused to help, but Perdiccas's arrival changed everything. Ariarates was crushed, and the grateful Eumenes was installed as governor. He would prove an invaluable ally for Perdiccas. Perdiccas headed back to Babylon, crushing any resistance to Macedonian rule in his path. His position had strengthened significantly, and Nicaea was now nearing Babylon. However, Soon Perdiccas learned that the sister of Alexander, Cleopatra, desired his hand in marriage, and he now faced a great dilemma. A marriage to Cleopatra would give him a claim to the throne, yet to disregard Nicaea would put him at odds with Antipater. Hoping to appease Antipater, Perdiccas married Nicaea. At the same time, however, he sent letters to Cleopatra, telling her he intended to discard Nicaea and marry her instead as soon as possible. Somehow, news of this reached the governor of Phrygia, Antigonus, who had no love for Perdiccas and had already disobeyed him once before by refusing to aid Eumenes. Antigonus sailed to Europe to inform Antipater, who was crushing the final remnants of the revolt in Greece. Antipater was outraged. Gathering his forces, including the formidable Macedonian general Craterus, 
Antipater prepared for war. He also found an ally in the governor of Egypt, Ptolemy, whose relations with Perdiccas had always been strained, and he readily accepted Antipater's plan. Perdiccas was still unaware of the impending war against him. As was agreed previously, he was sending Alexander's body back to Macedonia with a small escort. However, as this escort was passing through Syria, Ptolemy seized the body, which was then transported to Egypt. At the same time, Antipater was making his final preparations to cross into Asia, announcing his aim to remove Perdiccas. The First War of the Diadochi had begun. On receiving these two pieces of news, Perdiccas gathered his generals. He was planning to confront Ptolemy in Egypt. While Eumenes was ordered to delay Antipater in Anatolia and slow the enemy advance. Perdiccas's army travelled quickly and in the summer of 321 BC they reached the most eastern branch of the Nile Delta. However, the river was heavily guarded as Ptolemy had deployed garrisons all along the opposite bank. He himself was leading the central army intent on shadowing Perdiccas's movements and preventing his foe from crossing. Perdiccas needed a swift victory, so one night he force marched his army far upriver, hoping to cross the Nile before Ptolemy could prevent it. The crossing Perdiccas had selected was guarded by an Egyptian fort called the Camel's Rampart, in which Ptolemy had placed a small garrison. Reaching the crossing just before daybreak, Perdiccas quickly prepared his forces to attack. He was desperate to capture the fort before Ptolemy could arrive with reinforcements. To lead the crossing, Perdiccas placed his Indian war elephants. Behind them, he placed his elite infantry force, the Silver Shields, armed with ladders to scale the walls. The final line consisted of Perdiccas's cavalry. The assault commenced. Initially, this crossing met no difficulty. Yet as his troops got closer to the fort, Ptolemy's army appeared and rushed to the fort, reinforcing the garrison and denying Perdiccas an easy victory. Perdiccas and his army pressed on, attempting to take the fort by force. The elephants were driven forward to smash down the gates, while the silver shields were to scale the walls with their ladders. A desperate struggle ensued. Casualties were high on either side. In the end, however, Ptolemy and his defending force prevailed, and Perdiccas was forced to retreat. Perdiccas now desperately searched for another crossing. Dissent had already begun to spread among his army, and he had to quickly achieve success. Perdiccas marched his army even further up the Nile, to the bank opposite Ptolemy's capital at Memphis. Here, the river was wider, deeper, and had a stronger current. There was a large island separating the two banks, on which Perdiccas decided he would encamp his army. To ease the crossing, Perdiccas devised a solution. The elephants were placed upstream to slow the current. A line of cavalry was also placed downstream to collect any soldiers that lost their footing. For a time, the strategy worked well. The river became shallower and a part of Perdiccas's infantry successfully made it to the island. But then, disaster struck. As the elephants dug their feet into the riverbed, gradually the sand sank beneath them and the water level increased. Within no time at all, the river had become too deep to cross. His army divided, Perdiccas could send no more men. Those that had already reached the island found themselves stranded. Reluctantly, Perdiccas called them back. Thinking only of survival, the stranded soldiers plunged into the water. Some of the better swimmers managed to make it back. Many others, however, would either drown or be eaten by the lurking crocodiles. Perdiccas had suffered another humiliating defeat, and his army demanded blood. Perdiccas's generals, Antigenes, Pytho, and Seleucus, were all too happy to oblige. Going to his tent, they murdered the regent. 
To the north, Eumenes was facing heavy opposition to his command. The fleets quickly defected to Antipater, aiding his army's crossing into Asia before Eumenes could even arrive. More dissent followed, as many of Perdiccas's generals, even his brother Alcitas, refused to serve under Eumenes. Another general, Neoptolemus, betrayed Eumenes. A small clash ensued, and although Eumenes did prevail, Neoptolemus escaped to join Antipater. The odds now looked heavily stacked against Eumenes. Neoptolemus informed Antipater and Craterus of Eumenes' perilous situation. Believing the reports, Antipater divided his army in two. Craterus and Neoptolemus were tasked with confronting Eumenes. Meanwhile, Antipater continued east, towards Perdiccas and Egypt. Barely ten days after Neoptolemus's betrayal, the forces of Eumenes and Craterus faced each other somewhere in Phrygia near the Hellespont. Craterus was confident of victory and expected Eumenes' Macedonian troops to quickly join him. Yet Eumenes had other ideas. Knowing that his Macedonian troops would never knowingly fight against Craterus, one of the most revered Macedonian generals of the time, Eumenes devised a plan. He did not reveal to them that Craterus was leading the opposing army. Instead, he claimed the army that they were facing was led by the treacherous Neoptolemus and a barbarian warlord named Pigres. Knowing that Craterus would place himself on the right flank, the position of honour in the Macedonian line, Eumenes deployed a large contingent of Asian and Thracian cavalry to oppose him. Not a single Macedonian was included in this unit. In the centre, 20,000 infantrymen were deployed, with a corps made of a small number of Macedonian phalangites. The rest were mercenaries from Asia Minor and light infantry from Mesopotamia. As for Eumenes, he stayed on the right wing with his most powerful horsemen from Cappadocia. As Eumenes had expected, Craterus positioned himself on the right wing with just over a thousand of his best cavalry the Companions. In the centre, he deployed his 20,000 strong infantry, mostly Macedonians, trained in the formidable Pike Phalanx formation. On his left, Craterus placed Neoptolemus with the rest of his cavalry. Craterus advanced his cavalry ahead to the top of the hill, ready to show himself to Eumenes' soldiers. As Craterus and his army reached the top, however, Eumenes sprung his trap. Seeing Craterus, his Asian and Thracian cavalry charged the general, immune to the aura of the man. At the same time, Eumenes led his own wing against Neoptolemus on the right, keeping his infantry far back, away from any possibility of hearing who they were facing. A deadly cavalry battle now erupted on both flanks, with neither side's infantry force close enough to come to the aid. Horsemen against horsemen, it was now a bitter struggle to the death. Outnumbered by unknown warriors, Craterus and his cavalry were quickly overwhelmed, and the general fell in this melee. Our sources differ on how he was killed, and he was either trampled underfoot after stumbling from his horse, or he perished after much heroic fighting. Whichever is true, the result remained the same. Another of Alexander's most formidable generals now lay dead on the field. Hearing of his death, Craterus's right wing panicked and soon shattered completely. Meanwhile, on the left wing, Eumenes and Neoptolemus's horsemen had been engaged in a ferocious clash. Amidst the fighting, both generals attempted to find one another. Finally, they spotted each other in the melee and charged. After a bloody struggle, Eumenes emerged victorious. Both Craterus and Neoptolemus were now dead. The battle was over, and Eumenes had gained a stunning victory. This former secretary had emerged victorious over the most revered Macedonian general of the time. Yet the news soon reached Eumenes of the events in Egypt, 
Perdiccas was dead, and his troops had joined Ptolemy. Antipater's coalition now decided to rearrange the empire in what was later called the Partition of Triparadisus. He was to replace Perdiccas as regent, and the royal family were to be taken back to Macedonia. However, Eumenes and the remnants of Perdiccas' forces throughout the empire were keen on resistance and had to be dealt with. The man selected for this task was Antigonus. This general, now nearing 60 years old, headed with a large army to confront Eumenes, who was in Phrygia at that time. Eumenes desperately searched for allies, as he couldn't fight Antigonus alone. Hoping to unite his forces with Perdiccas' brother, Alcitas, he marched to Pisidia. Unfortunately, however, both wanted to lead the united army, and their differences proved too great. Eumenes was on his own. Eumenes now moved deeper into Asia Minor, with Antigonus in hot pursuit. At a place called Orkinia, Eumenes turned to face his pursuer. However, in the ensuing battle, Antigonus successfully deceived Eumenes. Pretending he had received reinforcements, he extended his phalanx to half the usual depth, doubling its length. To Eumenes' army, Antigonus' force looked massive, and they were instantly disheartened. Furthermore, during the ensuing fight, one of Eumenes' cavalry generals, Apollonides, deserted. Slaughter soon followed. Eumenes' army was routed. Escaping with a small force of loyalists, Eumenes retreated in all haste to the fortified city of Nora in Cappadocia. Antigonus arrived soon after, but desiring to avoid the siege, he offered Eumenes the chance to negotiate. Eumenes readily accepted the offer. Terms were discussed, with both desiring a peaceful decision. Messengers were sent to Antipater to decide the matter, and Eumenes returned to Nora to await the results. Little did he know, however, that very soon he would become the central figure in deciding the future of Alexander's empire. His military endeavors were just beginning. We often say that we want our channel to be a gateway to more learning, and the sponsor of this video might help our viewers with just that. Numerit Scholar is the best way to save a ton of money on your bachelor's degree. And if you haven't graduated college yet, they'll help you find the best way to graduate quickly and affordably. Numerit will allow you to save money with less expensive online courses and transfer the credits into your school. You can support our channel and get a free quote at lumerit.com forward slash kings and generals, or by clicking the link in the description. Thank you for watching the first video in our series on the wars of the Diadochi. More episodes on their conflicts are on the way. We would like to express our gratitude to our Patreon supporters who make the creation of our videos possible. You can also support us directly via YouTube by pressing the sponsorship button below the video. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you in the next episode.